Join Crestron Director of Sales for UC Enterprise, Andrew Gross, and a panel of experts spanning large enterprise, education, and integration as they discuss the key issues and trends impacting each of their areas today and their vision of what they might look like tomorrow. Welcome, and thank you for joining the Crestron Next Enterprise Roundtable, the future of work. A future that is clearly very interesting. We gave you guys an extra five minutes to think about. I'm Andrew Gross, and with me today are some incredible people from around the country and Canada to discuss, argue, agree, disagree, and hopefully provide guidance on what this team of experts sees the future of work and learning to truly be. Some quick housekeeping before we get started. The biggest reminder, ask questions. This is gonna be done in your chat window. These will be filtered and moderated and then asked to the panel throughout the session and of course at the end. Also included are some really helpful files on the tab right above your chat window. These include product info sheets and even a map of my entire team around the country and in Europe for you to reach out to after the show to continue this conversation. Remember, please focus your questions on the future of work, the future of learning, and how the enterprise and university systems will adapt to this incredible change we are seeing with new technology being adopted at an ever-increasing pace. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel of experts. First, we have Robert Basile. Robert is the technology strategist for Fiber Deep Networks at Corning Optical. Thanks for joining, Robert. We also have Rebecca Inoue. She is the Director of Partner Alliances at AVISPL. Thank you, Rebecca. And of course, Joe Wei, the Director of Learning Environments at USC. Thanks for joining, Joe. So I'd like to start this panel off by asking a fairly simple but rather broad opening question. With large enterprise, education, and integration well represented on this panel, let's start by each of you stating what your vision of the future of work looks like. Share a vision of what the average day will be in your office or classroom one to two years from now. Because personally, I think it'll be very different from what we just had five months ago. And Rebecca, I'd like to start with you. Yes, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I, I think when we want to take a look at the future, we need to maybe reflect a little bit in the past. And if we go back to people like Marissa Mayer from Yahoo, I'm not sure if any of you remember her, but she had banned actually working from home um, in the past. If we fast forward to today, it's a completely different world out there. Um, even after going back into the office, things are not going to be the same. We have users uh, across North America, across the world, who are used to having desktop phones. They've gone into their home offices where now they're used to using cloud-based solutions, such as WebEx Teams, Zoom, Google. Companies now, when they start to have employees that are returning to the office, they're going to have to be able to address this issue of what their employees are used to now and what they were used to in their old workspaces and how are organizations and educational institutions going to do this um, as they start moving back into the workspaces. That topology is going to look very different for all of our customers um, around the world. At AVISPL, we like to call it the elastic digital workplace where organizations are going to need and want a more seamless, ubiquitous environment. That ability to move from home office to a mobile device, to a desk, to a meeting space, to an open collaboration space, and all the way back again. So um, there's a number of areas that are going to need to be addressed as well in this new world because at the same time, not everybody is going to be going back to the office. Um, organizations across the world have said, you know, they're pretty confident that 30 to 50% of employees are going to remain at that work, and ho work from home environment at least a couple of times a week. So really it's the rise of the end user. And again, that elastic sort of workplace environment that our customers are looking for. 
Yeah, Rebecca, I think that elasticity that you bring up is is huge, right? That, that and elasticity, flexibility of what that workplace or, of course, even the learning environment looks like. I want to throw it over to Robert now. Uh, you know, Robert, you guys at Corning are doing a bunch of interesting things, too. What does your vision of the future of work look like at Corning? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. And I mean, what a what an answer to follow. I think uh, I couldn't agree more with, with everything there. You know, at Corning, we're a we're a technology company. Um, we're deep into cellular and wireless technologies. Obviously, we're we're the world leader in infrastructure and fiber connectivity. You know, a huge area for us that that Rebecca started to hit on is just how technology is going to play such a huge part um, in this transition. Um, myself as a person who, you know, is on a hundred plus flights a year, I've always been the person that's out of the office, right? Trying to come into collaborative spaces where people are face to face. And so it's been a real trend that we've had at Corning where, you know, we want our spaces to be very mobile first. We want people to be able to collaborate together, even if they're not together. Um, I think as far as, you know, our physical spaces go, uh, again, with that emergence of kind of using the technologies that we have from audio visual to scheduling right down to all the wireless and the connectivity, um, it's going to play a, an increasing role to make all this happen um, to really bridge that gap of, of, you know, so we can still come together and so we can still collaborate. Yeah, and, and you know, before we go to Joe, I think maybe some people are, are curious, you know, well, why do we have a, a university on an, an enterprise roundtable? But I think a lot of people forget that, especially these larger universities, they, they operate as enterprises. I mean, you've got more than just classrooms, Joe, right? I mean, you have conference rooms, you have private offices, you have the makings of a massive enterprise campus. So same question to yourself, but what is USC's vision to this, both from a learning and a work environment? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because people do say that. Why would you have higher ed? Like, I believe that uh, we are Prestron's largest VC4 deployment, right? We are an enterprise, a city in ourselves, right? And, you know, when you look at what the future it holds, um, you, you have to look at, okay, on Friday the 13th and March 13th, when we all boosted online and we took all the courses online, that really wasn't the future. That was kind of saving what we want to do. And we might still be living in that world, but now we need to think is what will it really look like? In higher ed, you know, the students want to come back. We are about that traditional campus experience. But the fact is a lot of good has actually come out of moving to a virtual environment. A lot of things where we can build this community and that's really what what people miss about, right? When you wanna to go to college, you wanna get away and you wanna to go to that community. So how can we use our tools to better create that same environment, both virtually and on-prem? You know, and we have found that. What we have done is actually did an entire campus enterprise upgrade of, uh, you know, for example, the Crestron Flex devices being thrown in every single space to create these hybrid high flex learning environments where students can be away and you can have faculty in the room and in the classrooms. We can find that um, students groups, you know, now no longer need spaces. They can do breakout rooms and they can meet virtually online where you can have a digital campus as well as a physical campus. So yeah, will we start to see a move back, you know, to, to the brick and mortar? Yes, but maybe that's only a place and a physical location and not actually where they're gonna continue to like live and develop. Because I think especially this younger generation, as with, you know, even Rebecca had mentioned, you know, can you move from your mobile device, especially college age kids? Can you put the learning spaces mobile? Can you take it so they can attend from our common spaces as well as a classroom, as well as their dorms, you know, in the fraternity and sorority houses. And it's really being able to involve all of those various areas to create, uh, th this really new environment. It's exciting to see. It's exciting to see how a lot of my colleagues are being very creative with the solutions to create that. And I think it's going to really change all of higher ed moving forward. Yeah, there's a common theme I'm hearing between all three of you is, of course, elasticity, flexibility, and then hybrid, I think is the other big you know, key term here. Uh, you know, Robert, I want to throw back to you now to sort of open up the conversation to the panels now that you guys have all provided your vision. Um, and I have some data here from, from Frost and Sullivan. And, and what they did was they were able to identify that the pre-pandemic work from home workforce was around 5%. Currently, you know, during this pandemic was around 50 plus percent of large enterprises were work from home. And then post pandemic, they look to sit around the 25 to 30 percent area. 
So Robert, I think a key thing from this is that yes, there's a pre and a current and a post pandemic, but I, I think we all are seeing that the COVID era is going to be here for a little while. And what the COVID era has truly done to the enterprise regarding this work from home, flexibility, elasticity, and hybrid work, amount, uh, work environment is here to stay. I'm curious where Corning sits at these current levels. Are you guys seeing this current 50 plus percent work from home? And, and what are you guys doing today to allow for collaboration to remain pretty consistent and efficient at Corning? Yeah, it's, it's so we've, you know, as a corporation, we've been very closely following, you know, everywhere where we have a headquarters, following exactly kind of what the, the government recommendations are. Um, we took some pretty extreme approaches up front. Um, the majority of our facilities were closed down only on, you know, special condition could you enter. Um, so I, I would say outside of our factories, um, you know, our, our enterprise, uh, our corporate resources, they, they've mostly almost 100 percent then work at home. Um, our factories have had to continue on um, how, how they would at full operation. Um, there's one really interesting part about all this is that, you know, telecom infrastructure is certainly not in a decline. Um, people are realizing the importance and the builds, you know, continues to go on. So um, I'd say from kind of our corporate offices, we've had to adapt to that. Um, we've obviously had to adapt inside of our, our factories and other critical facilities um, to keep them open, to keep them safe. Um, it's, it's a really kind of key thing. Um, as you know, things continue to hopefully continue to get better out there, um, we will see a return to the office um, in those, those spaces, including our new Charlotte headquarters. Um, I think we're all excited for it. And you know, one of the things that, that we're really doing to kind of pre-plan as, as we get back in is um, obviously you know, temperature checks, things like that at the door to keep the employees safe. But even more so, once you're in the spaces, you know, continuing that collaboration that we've all hit upon. Um, people can be at their desk. They can be across the building in different rooms. They can, you know, be booking spaces ahead of time um, to kind of limit interaction that's out there. So that's all going to play a key, you know, role in how we get back in and how we get back in safely. I think the other element will just be balancing, you know, who continues to work from home, who goes into the office. And, and I think that the idea of who's a, you know, a critical in-person worker, I think is going to drastically change as, as we kind of go forward. Yeah, you know, Re Rebecca, you're, you're in an interesting position here as, as not only mm -hmm. as, as you at AVISPL are probably doing this from a corporate standard, but you're probably seeing a lot of what Robert is talking about being deployed across all of your, your customers and your partners from Microsoft to Zoom to, of course, Crestron and probably all the customers that you work with. Are you seeing what Robert's talking about also being done? And how, what other trends are you seeing being done both in the higher ed and uh, large enterprise to create a not just efficient workplace, but also a safe workplace mm -hmm. that enables and, and truly does allow for collaboration? Yeah, gosh, I have so many, so many answers to all of those questions. So I'm going to start with that last one of the last highlights you mentioned around safety. Um, that is a big um, conversation with our customers and with our, our organization internally. And, and what that really means is how can we assist our, our customers and our own staff to return safely to a work environment? So it means uh, expanding um, where we need to look. So we need to start looking at intelligent workspaces. We need to look at um, the ability of how do we start using AI in the workspaces to ensure that things like social distancing are, are taking place. Um, automation then starts to come into play with our customers looking for the ability to deploy virtual assistants, um, remote concierge service, uh, similar to the ability that we have today with many of our customers tying in things like Crestron XIO with our managed services around Symphony to be able to understand what's going on in the spaces, how many people are in those spaces to be able to proactively and intelligently help keep employees safe when they are in those work environments. Joe, are, are you seeing the, some of that mm -hmm. already at, at USC? You know, Rebecca mentioned some big things like AI. Are, are we at that level at, at say a large university like USC? I think we lost Joe's I audience. should know that by now. No, it should know better to not hit the mute button. You know, totally AI nice, is not And then I kill, I know. Uh, it should recognize the mouth moving. No, um, but yeah, I think uh, AI, and especially what you're saying with safety, 
you know, throwing the occupancy sensors and the movement control, understanding that students need to be spaced. I mean, if you're dealing with uh, 18 to 22 year olds, good luck keeping social distancing. Mm -hmm. This is why a lot are still, you know, online for the fall. But now what we can do is we can start using these technologies to, um, you know, to inform us when there are things that are being broken, you know, the rules are being broken and to ensure that our spaces are being kept safe. So we're absolutely seeing it. Uh, we're, we're doing it ourselves, mainly with automation, voice control, those types of things. Uh, and I think that a lot of schools are doing that same thing as well, and will continue to do it moving forward. Um, I think that we've gotten there. You know, everyone has talked about, oh, wouldn't it be cool to have voice control or touchless things mm -hmm. and all that? And no one ever did it, especially in higher ed, when you look at having to do it at such a large scale. But I think we're all there now. And we're all recognizing that how can we utilize these other tools? Um, and, and we're doing it all the time. Um, and I don't think we're rare. Robert, what about Corning? Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, some really kind of good points hit on there. I, I think the trend you see kind of coming from Rebecca, Joe, myself, I mean, again, I kind of made the point before, technology is only going to be ever increasing, you know, in these spaces. Um, one of the things that we really try to do up front as a technology, as an infrastructure company, you know, I mentioned that, you know, it, we're, we were a glass ceramics company, right, that kind of moved up to the stack into wireless technologies mm -hmm. and other pieces that kind of connect those dots. And, you know, one of the things that we tried to really model inside of our own headquarters was these concepts of bringing infrastructure, bringing probably the two most valuable commodities that you can in both bandwidth and power to the edge of a network that are ready there. Um, you know, we, we I'm a sales guy at heart most days, you know, and one of the terms that gets overused out there so much is just the concept of being future proof, right? Well, I think, you know, if this pandemic has taught us anything, you can't be future proof, right? Technology was already kind of going at leaps and bounds, but... You know, the big thing that we've kind of gone to is you have to be as future flexible as possible, you know, ready to adapt, ready to kind of take on those things you didn't necessarily expect. So when we set out in our headquarters, one of the biggest things that we did is we ran fiber and power as deep as possible everywhere inside of our facility that allow us to have completely state of the art audio visual. But it also allowed us to be ready for Internet of Things, right? Occupancy sensors our scheduling. Uh, tying together our smart glass that's on our building, that it's automatically tinting as the sun's going up and down. Mm -hmm. Things like that will continue to only grow. The use cases will only grow for the technology. And then one last point, you know, that, that I'll probably expand on a bit later is, is our space is actually 100% wireless first. There's no physical kind of connectivity drops anywhere in the facility outside of kind of those aggregation points. Again, being the AV, being the wireless, being the security, that type of stuff. There's no drops in conference rooms. Um, there's no drops in user spaces, offices. Everything is meant to um, use air media. Everything's meant to be, you know, you walk into a space and you can immediately be on the display. So I think those trends that we tried to hit on before any of this started will only continue out there. And I, again, you know, that technology piece is going to be that one of the helpers that allows us to maybe not prevent the stuff that's going to happen, but certainly it's going to start to mitigate it and give us the knowledge of how we can kind of move forward. Robert, let, let's stay with you, actually, because you bring up some really good points, um, and, and you say you're going to expand on it later. We can make later be now about your, uh, your wireless trend. But I want to add to it, um, because because in the Harvard Business Review, I was looking at some of these recent trends that they were putting out there in their publication over the next six to 12 months in meeting rooms. And, and one of them was reduced seating. The other was move to contactless engagement. And more rooms equals more video. And I'll add another one on there being that wireless trend because it's very broad right wireless can mean how you're connecting to the video wireless can mean how you're actually allowing for contactless engagement with technology so it does kind of overarching support a lot of these trends so first off I guess do you agree or disagree with, with these types of trends that HBR has referenced over the next six to 12 months and how are you guys doing it no, I, I think absolutely it's on point. And so I, I use the word wireless vaguely uh, or, or broadly on, on purpose. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things is that, especially when you talk about a student population, uh, maybe an enterprise population, right, with kind of mixed age workforce that may be out there, everything needs to be seamless. That's the trend across all kinds of technologies. In our facility, we enabled uh, cellular technologies at the same time that we've enabled very dense Wi-Fi. And the idea is no matter what you're connected to, no matter where you are in the building, you have a seamless experience that's out there. And so that's really been, you know, one of the key trends that, that we've, you know, tried to hit home. 
Um, I think, you know, the other thing that we've really done is, is, you know, we came from a space that was almost 80% offices and, and conference rooms, very few cubicles. So everything was kind of very closed off. There wasn't as much collaboration. Our new building is wide open architecture, even to the point where we had to install sound masking, right, to kind of damper the noise that could be out in large common areas. And one of the things that's come along with that is we have much smaller kind of intimate conference spaces, but our NVX solution that's out there allows us to kind of connect those spaces together. So it's like we're in the same room, right? We're not losing that collaborative spirit just because we may be across the building. It's also helped us where, you know, there's not a rush on who can get the 20 person conference room any given day out there, right? Any room can become whatever size we need to in the facility. And also for our executives to go and address staff or give us all spaces that we can kind of settle into. That, that's that's really what's making it happen with that wireless being the bridge to really kind of make it seamless, make people, while technology is really in your face, make it seamless that they don't need to necessarily worry about it. Joe, are you seeing the same types of things creep into higher ed as well? Oh, absolutely. I'm sitting here just nodding at everything he's saying because uh, we completely are. Um, and it's interesting because even you say it's moving to wireless, we're completely moving. And what we have just done is a complete move to everything being software-based, cloud-based, um, everything that can be IT centric is what we have just done is on an entire enterprise level from BC4 to Fusion Cloud, to XIO Cloud, to CH5, to you name it. Um, if it offered an opportunity to do that, we did that. And now people say, well, why would we move, you know, to everything being, you know, IT centric? And because then that does allow even the wireless. Our rooms are so smart, even going back to the last question, that because we can now tie in all of our other devices with, say, you know, the Flex device and having every room Zoom enabled, it can be so smart that the occupancy sensor goes off when they walk in the room, they already know who they are. It launches their Zoom class and puts the faculty member already in the room and they didn't have to do it anything. Um, and that's where you could really start to offer, you know, a true white glove service to the faculty. Um, it takes your SLAs down, you know that your trouble calls go down, because the rooms start to do everything themselves by being able to move away from the traditional, uh, you know, AV systems into, you know, these newer cloud software based uh, ecosystems that, uh, that we've just been impressed with and the faculty members who have now used the spaces. Uh, just can't stop talking enough about them. And we see that now even, even in the workspaces, our group study spaces, and those who will continue to be able to work will work from home can now call into these rooms just as simply. And that's really where you start to connect people and the technology works for the good of it and not against you. And I think we went through a big, uh, you know, a lot of, especially in higher ed, we would dread the trouble ticket, right? Because our technic technology was always working against <laughs> us. And now that's completely switched. It's now being used to actually connect people in an easy, frictionless way. And that's, and I think this is a new trend and one that's gonna continue. One that we've always been talking about, is it's not what we would, would talk about for years with future-proofing. We really just meant quit calling me. It's really what we meant by future-proofing. <laughs> and, well, Robert um, said, future-preparing, right? <laughs> exactly, and now we're actually there. And we can do that. And I'm seeing a lot of institutions now. Um, we're still early in it, but it's definitely the trend that will continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Rebecca, I want you to put your integrator hat on for a second since you just kind of heard from obviously Corning being large enterprise and USC being large education. Uh, you know, these trends that they're talking about, uh, I've got two questions for you. Uh, the first one being, you know, do, do you see that what USC and Corning are doing, is, is that common across a lot of the other massive enterprises and educational universities that you're working with? And the other big one that I'd like for you to answer is, do you see some of this technology implementation being just a, maybe a pandemic knee-jerk reaction? Or are these permanent changes that are gonna be both adopted and further implemented for years to come? Yeah, both, both really good questions. And there's a yes and a no to that first question. So I don't think a lot of our customers are exactly where Corning is today. Are the conversations around that type of work environment happening on a daily basis with a number of our customers um, globally? Absolutely. So we're seeing a real trend with all of our customers wanting that, that next step um, because this has been huge, right? Customers have been pushed into the cloud 
um, with with a moment's notice. Um, and that's not going to to reverse at any time, I think, in, in the future and moving forward. And so then with that, it really changes to, to Joe's point, um, organizations' abilities to be able to effectively manage their workforces and manage spaces and manage collaboration uh, at a completely different level and to also proactively manage those through integrated you know, workplace management systems. Um, so yes, the conversations are there. Are all of our customers there? Absolutely not. Are we working on designs on a daily basis around things like collaboration, automation, safety, intelligent workspaces and security? That's our that's our future, and those those key points are never going to go away. They'll probably go up and down as to what organizations want, um, and then yes, I think it's here to stay. I think once people start moving into those workspaces again, we have the short term of wow, we've got to really monitor how many people are in each space, and we can do that with our IoT sensors and room occupancies and room booking intelligence um, to, you know, limit the number of people going into different spaces. I think once everybody, once that starts tipping over to the 50 to 70 percent of people going back into the workspaces, um, I think then the shift is going to get back to, um, again, collaboration and how do we do that and uh, continuing on with the automation and the intelligence in the workspaces. With that and the ubiquitous environment, I hope that answers your questions. No, it, it it absolutely does. I hope it answers a lot of the audience's questions too. And speaking of questions, we've got a ton coming in. I definitely want to spend the next ten minutes and get to these. So thank you everyone again for asking all these amazing questions. Um, these are fantastic. Let me go to this one right here. Uh, I'll start with you, Robert. Which technologies do you believe are going to be winners, and which technologies are going to be losers as a result of COVID nineteen? Hmm. So kind of a loaded question. I mean, we have what I would call our baseline technologies, right? And I'll, I'll use some broad terms again for these, but I don't think they'd be a surprise to anyone. This is a wireless world. So, you know, the growth of cellular technologies, the growth of, of Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6, we see coming on like crazy right now, uh, 5G, those are only going to bring spaces together. Um, the great part for Corning is obviously fiber brings all those pieces um, but, you know, beyond that, I, I think what, what, you know, Andrew, I've jokingly kind of said to you and some of your team before, it's amazing. We built a brand new headquarters at Corning, and obviously we have all of our own gear and all of our own stuff on display. Probably vendor number two, um, it, which should be pretty proud for you guys, is, is Crestron, right? So that was really our first foray as, as Corning, you know, and, and building a brand new headquarters recently, um, scheduling uh, the air media. You know, I, I don't think we really have anybody that even plugs into HDMI cables anymore in the space. That's something to be said for a company that, you know, we had to worry about what rooms we walked into, you know, if the projector was good or not before. Um, so so that's, it's just huge leaps and bounds. So I think that stuff's the no-brainer of what's going to stick around. Obviously, surveillance will continue to be key. Um, I think what's really interesting is how much this is going to push that, that Internet of Things, you know, that kind of overused term, that broad term, how much it's going to push that forward, right? An occupancy sensor maybe is no longer a nice to have to control the lights. Now it's actually, you know, to an extent, life safety, right? Or, or you know, safety for, for staff that's in the space. Um, also, you know, things like automation, right? Controlling how things turn up, turn down in a space when it stops being used, I think is going to be really interesting. Th those are going to be, you know, my areas to watch. Um, I think you have the no-brainers or trends that we're moving that will continue to move. And then you're going to have this new kind of piece of that Internet of Things that gets fast-forwarded by three to five years that maybe, you know, we weren't necessarily keeping our eye on as a, as a must-to-have before. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I, we had another good one here, and, and I'm going to forward this one to you, Joe. Uh, you know, you don't have to give, obviously, a, a, either a numerical value, but I'm, I'm looking for maybe an idea, order of magnitude would be helpful. But we're getting a lot of questions of, you know, how much is USC investing in home learning spaces? And, and Robert, if you have anything to add, maybe from a home workspaces, maybe even just a, a percentage increase or an idea of where your focuses are headed for that homework or home learn. Um, 
Yeah. So how much we're investing in home learning is a it, it's a two sided question. One, um, honestly, we're not doing a ton as far as the students being in their home. Right. Uh, we do have a lot of students in need and we have a laptop loaner program as well as we have a hotspot loaner program where we will pick up the cost to send that to them, make sure that they have all of the proper uh, peripherals needed to be able to attend class in the right way. And usually what we find is you know lack of Wi-Fi or computing power who relied upon our physical spaces. So we found programs for that to help the students. The flip side of that is how we're using our campus, right? Uh, because by creating these hybrid spaces, what we found is we can also, going back to actually my original uh, answer of the first question, was start to create community. Right. There's a big difference when a faculty member uh, teaches their class from their living room, which works, right? We're all in line, it works. But if they teach it from a classroom, the students actually feel more value. They feel that they're connected to the campus. They go, I recognize that building. Maybe I'm not there, but I feel like I'm getting the value of my education. And it's weird, but it's a, it's one of those subliminal things. So we've really invested a lot into that, that campus environment. Again, we were kind of lucky this entire enterprise upgrade. We'd already begun pre-COVID. So I looked like the smartest person in the room when I could already answer the COVID response when they came to me. How are we going to do this? <laughs> We're already doing it. You just, uh, because we moved everyone off campus, I can start two months earlier. That's really all that happens. Um, so we did that. And if you want to talk, I mean, order of magnitude, we, we spent millions. I mean, four to six million. So it's, it's, it's quite a... That's a big number, right? I mean, I think it, there's there's no secret, right? That uh, learning from home, working from home is, it, it, yes, it may feel that it's a trend right now, but it's certainly here to stay. It's just how that does integrate better into our daily lives and our daily schedule, I think is really the big question. Um, so to Rebecca, here's a great question for you. And this, this is a big one. Um, so tr we'll try and see if we can keep it summarized. Uh, but we have a question of why do so many organizations struggle to integrate AV and IT practices? And what suggestions can you give to do it better? Yes. So um, that, is a, that is a loaded question. And I would say it is fundamentally a, a corporate um, culture Thing. And I mean that from a global perspective, you know, we've gone from audio visual being the, you know, the pull down screen in the front of a room and a projector on the ceiling. And in the classroom environments, it's been the, you know, the person who rolls in the projector or the little machine. I don't even know what they're even called anymore, where the slides would go on to um, something that is far more robust. Right. So now we've got. Um, work environments and, you know, networks that now require something that is more IT based. Um, and there is a convergence between audiovisual and IT. And we're seeing that the AV needs to sort of go away from that traditional standpoint because we're really in that IT world. And that's where we, we need to be in order to deliver solutions to customers. So what that means for organizations is organizations, if they have that separation between audio visual and IT, they need to start merging those together and understanding that they're not separate, that they are, they are one thing and they are being driven by different um, UC platforms. They're being driven by the cloud. They're being driven by wireless networks and mobility. So they need to converge. So if organizations have separate departments, they need to pull them together. Um, and then the story then needs to also start working with facilities and corporate visions and corporate stories. So now you're not just even talking about IT stuff, you're talking about a corporate culture. So if you can converge the two into one group that are working also with facilities and with the vision of an organization, I think you'll start, companies who are starting to look for solutions will have a more cohesive approach when they start talking with companies like AVISPL um, or with Corning. Um, and I think it'll just be a, a, better, a better story because you can't separate them out anymore. If you do, you run into problems and we see that every day. 
Yeah, I think we saw that convergence happening over the last several years. I know we spoke about it several times, either at shows or webinars. Um, but I think now, especially in 2020 and, and into the new years, uh, we're going to have to see that collaboration between the two organizations become better. Mm -hmm. The convergence has happened. We now need the collaboration. So unfortunately, that's actually all the time we have for questions today. Thank you again to everyone uh, who was able to provide those questions. We will get to your questions via written answers uh, very shortly. But thank you again for everyone who participated participated in this roundtable uh, and for asking questions. I hope that you guys were all able to refine a little bit of your own vision of the future of work and the future of learning. But most importantly, thank you all to the panelists. Uh, I really appreciate all of you sharing your expert take on what this future truly does look like. If anyone would like to learn more, please reference the UC Enterprise team map in the file section. Reach out to me directly, reach out to my team, and we can engage on how Crestron can help satisfy your needs for the future enterprise and the future university. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of Crestron Next, and thank you again to all of our incredible panelists.